Let's just call this up. There we are. So I started a, um, a series last week about what are the foundational blocks for 2018 for us as a church. And it was to build a family of uh, faith, hope, and love. So I'm not in any particular order, but that's the building block. So last week, I talked about what is this thing called family. So, so you know, I, sometimes we talk about communities, and I like the word communities, but I like the word family more, because I was in a community that was called Rogerstone Rugby Club, and we played rugby together, and we were tight, but we were not family. There were certain lines, especially when it came to England playing Wales, that I was English and they were Welsh, and the family thing didn't, you know, the the community suddenly went out the window. Um, But uh, I want us to be family because we live in a community in a a situation where we spend, especially our young people, a lot of time with our heads down in Facebook and in social media that we don't relate to one another. And I believe that the next move of God within the church is to be a father move, to be a move where he restores his family through the church here on earth. That makes sense to you? You know, and we're to rise up as a community, as a family to be that because there's so many young people running around today that don't really know who mum is, don't really know who dad is and don't have family and we need to be that family. Amen? You could probably shut the back door and turn the heating off. So this morning I want to talk about hope. So hope. So um. I looked in the dictionary. For those of you who know me, dictionaries are something that are quite alien to me. Um, I, I, I had one once. Um, I think I might have, I don't know what I did with it. But anyway, but apparently there's about 14 different definitions for hope. And um, I listened to this surgeon once and he said, if anybody offers you 14 options for an operation, don't take any of them. Because basically saying that none of them really work. The guy was a brain surgeon. He said, if you get offered one option for one operation, take it. Because that means it's the best one. But there's 14 or 15 different ways that you can look in, in the dictionary and you can see this word hope. But the one that I like is if you look at hope and you go back to the original of where that word comes from, it comes from this word Q, K-E-U. We got a slide for that? Oh, yeah. Do you want to run a pause for the slides? He actually Googled this because he didn't believe me. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, see? I don't just look on Wikipedia. Um, so this word Q, and it actually means it actually means curve or it means to change direction. And I believe hope is to believe in something that's not in your obvious path. Does that make sense? So to believe, I believe in something over there because what in front of me doesn't look good, but I have a hope that if I change direction, I'll find what I need. You know, and I think, you know, we, we live in a, in a society, especially in January, where everybody's making lots of money about get fit books, get, you know, the apps that are coming through on your Facebook, get rich books, manage this. Bitcoin, invest all your money into Bitcoin. Those of you know what Bitcoin is? Yeah, if you don't, look it up. Don't invest your money. You've missed the boat with Bitcoin, haven't you? Yeah, missed the boat. Uh, but there's all this stuff about doing this and doing that and doing these things. And if you do this, you'll get a six-pack like me. Don't laugh. <laughs> huh? So nothing, a family pack. Um, but I believe that we choose to go on a curve and I put my hope in something outside of this world and it's called God. That's where my hope is, you know, and, and I think the world is looking for hope in something that's right in front of them, and we're looking for hope for something that is outside of this world. Uh, we're looking for in a different direction, and I think well, as a church, as a family, we need to help shift people's direction from what's in front of them and to look on the curve over here to see what we have. I, I, I hope is something, a hope in God is what I anchor my life to. You know, I I, I like the fact that um, after 42 years of living on this planet, people say to me, it's different for you, Mike, because you have a faith. That's great because that shows to me that people see that my life is anchored. My hope is fixed in something outside of what's in front of me. Paul writes in Hebrew, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. I love the imagery of that, you know about the fact that we anchor ourselves 
to, to God, to his promises, to his word, to, to the Holy Spirit, to, to the goodness he has for us. You know, if you're anchored to something, where that, where that, that attaches you to it. See, if I anchor myself to a self-help group, that's all I've got. You know, I've got this self-help group, this, this uh, self-help book, and that's it. But when I anchor myself to the creator of the universe, the hope is endless. Self-help book, what, 86 pages? I don't know, however long it is. At the end of that 86 pages, what have I got? I have to go and find another book. Or I have to do another New Year's resolution next year. Anchor myself to God. When I get to the end of what I think is the end, I tell you, God always gives something different. He always stretches my hope and my faith in him, and he gives me something different. He's, a, he's, he's an endless supply of hope for my life. And I like the fact that he says if you anchor yourself to God, you can go beyond the curtain. Now, you have to understand what he's talking about is in the temple, they had this big curtain. And beyond the, tur- the curtain in the temple was the holies of holies, was where the presence of God was. And when Jesus came and he died on the cross, that curtain was ripped from top to bottom, which means a sinner saved by grace. If we accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ into our life, we get to step into the power and the authority of God. So if I anchor myself in God, I anchor myself in the power of who God is. Think about that. That's pretty nuts, isn't it? That's pretty extraordinary. So uh, the hope that I have, not is just the hope of nice words. I love you. You know, you're my son. It's a hope that comes with authority and power. It's a hope that means that I can say things about my life which aren't true, but claim them in the name of Jesus for my life. It's a hope that I can say, this year will be the best, best year we're ever going to have as a church. Not because I've looked at the budget and the bank balance, but because my hope is anchored in God. And if God, am I anchored in God and God's will is in my life, I can declare that. This is the year my family will have breakthrough. This is the year that I will see those things I've struggled with. I will see them come through because my hope is anchored in God. If it's anchored in the world, it will always have a, a, a shelf life to it. Uh, Percy Shelley. Apparently, Percy Shelley is a famous American poet. Any American poet scholars in the room? Oh, I'm disappointed. And he, he, <laughs> I'm a poet scholar myself. I'm not. I did write a poem once, and it was quite good. I gave it to my wife, and then she married me. He he talks about the fact that 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 hope isn't. It isn't expecting that everything's going to turn out amazing. It's an expecting that everything is going to turn out better and different. So, so often we put our hope in God and we say, God, I hope for this. And then it doesn't work out how we thought it was going to work out. So therefore, we become disappointed with God. Let me tell you, if you put your hope in God, you have to put your trust in God that what you get is his perfect plan for you. And it may be slightly different to what you thought. But when you learn to trust and to celebrate that, you find hope again. Does that make sense? So, for example, you know, I've been running this church for five years. I put my hope in every month in God's provision and finances for my family. It's not a big church. I don't get paid full time. And my expectation, I keep saying, Helen, this year I'm going to get paid full time. Or this April, she actually says, yeah, whatever, Mike. So my hope was in that God would provide the financial breakthrough for the pay rise for me. And it hasn't happened. Four and a half years, almost five years, it hasn't happened. But when I put my hope in what God is trying to tell me is that his provision is good enough for me, that when the money runs out, he'll, a check will come through the corner. When there's a bill I can't pay, he'll pay it for me. My hope is restored, but in a way that I didn't expect. And the reason that God is doing that for me, because if he gave me a full-time wage, my faith would be reduced because I trust in the full-time wage, not in him. I'd love a full-time wage. But I also wouldn't change the journey that I'm on of God's provision 
crazily provision for me as a family because it keeps my hope alive in that he is my provider. He is looking after me. And it also is a great guide for my life because when I go down a path and the provision's not there, I can say, hey, God, what's going on here? And God said, well, you went, you went down your own path a little bit here, Mike. If you come back over here, here's my provision for you. And I refocus my hope and my, 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 my track and my life, and then his provision comes back in. Does it make sense? So he's using, what, uh, using hope to guide me through life, to keep me on that curve of changing and following his path. So if God's not answering your prayer, maybe we need to pray for you, but maybe God's just saying, I want you just to turn your focus a little bit. Just a few degrees to the left. Maybe you're not getting that job you want, but maybe over here is the provision you need. Maybe it's over, you know, maybe the break. Maybe you just need to trust God with your with your husband that's not coming to church or your family members or whatever. Maybe you just need to, to say, God, I really do trust you with that family member. I trust that you'll look after them. And I'll carry on with what you got. Do you see what I mean? Amen. I went to a black church before Christmas and they say amen an awful lot. So if I say amen, you can say amen back. Amen? Oh, we're kind of getting there. You know, I, I believe that if the church can rise up and demonstrate its hope in God, it will bring color to a gray world. Because there's something about hoping in God that brings color to your life and color to your world. And, and we have to understand that God has chosen each one of us in a place called church to be his hope to humanity. To, to basically to, to see the world as our patience and to see the world as, as uh, those without God as people that we are to bring hope and grace and love and compassion to. God can turn up. My friend, he was in prison. God turned up like a light in his cell and said, I'm God. I have another friend, Anthony. You might meet him one day. He's a plumber, absolutely barking mad. His testimony is he was outside a rave and this light shone on him and said, I'm God. When you meet Anthony, you can say that makes complete sense. <laughs> complete sense because he's an absolute nutcase. His apprentice came to measure up for the toilets here and the apprentice is not a Christian. He said, um, what's Jesus done for you? He's like, died for my sins. What's Jesus that Jesus loves me? I said, are you a Christian? He says, no, but if I don't say it, he gives me a clip around the ear roll. <laughs> That's one way to, uh, you know, <laughs> evangelize for you. But, uh, but his, his testimony is that this light, but that's not the, the norm. The norm is I met someone down the coffee shop at work. And I noticed there was something different about them. And then when I was going through on a marriage breakup or whatever, they just spoke love and hope into my life. And that love and hope came from someone that was bigger than them. That love and hope came from God. We are God's love and hope to humanity. And I think so often we sit around as a church waiting for God to move and God to do something. And God's like, well, you do something. Because you are my bride. You are my, you are my people. You are my vessel. You do something so I can get behind what you're doing. I said to God uh, a few months ago, I said, God, I really want to pass to the whole of my community. That's not a good thing to say. My phone has been going something nuts this week from people that, are, that you would probably never ever meet. They may come to church, they may not come to church. Can we have coffee? Can we talk? Can I share? Can, can, can we talk about stuff? And, I, and I'm like, wow, God, what are you doing? I think God is taking a community called Faith of about 70, 50, 60, 70 people on a Sunday morning. And he's saying, if you rise up, you, you, you can be my hope beyond your church. And, and I'm just meeting people all the time. And they're saying, Mike, thanks for that conversation. And I'm being bold about what I believe and say, can I, the reason I can talk to you like this is because it's not me that's been talking to you for the last hour. It's been God talking to you through me. I know this sounds really weird, and they're like, yeah, this does sound really weird, but can I pray for you? And I'm like, yeah, okay, do whatever you want. And I pray for them, and they're like, there's a peace that's come upon me. I don't know where it comes from. I'm like, well, I believe it comes from God. God's doing something with us as a community, and he's a, if we say we want to be the hope to the world, he'll use you. He'll put you in those places. You know, hope's a risky thing. 
You know, you can put your hope in someone they can be dashed in, in an instant. You know, when you put your I put my hope in things. Do you want to put the heating back on, by the way? Yeah. Go on, Bill. Blast us with the jet engine. You know, many of us struggle to hope because we put our hope in something and it got dashed. Uh, I remember this. Is this is going on live stream? I don't think she'll see it. Rebecca Gibson. I put my hope in her. You know, we were really good friends. I thought we were going to get married. I was 19. She was 24. When you're this good looking, you can definitely bat above your weight, you know. But as a young lad, I put my hope that we were gonna we were gonna get married, and that we both worked for a Christian organization. And I thought we were gonna be missionaries. It was God's plan for my life to marry this amazing blonde girl. And then I told her I liked her, and she was like, "Well, I don't like you. You're just a good friend. You've been there. That was it. Just me. My hope was dashed. <laughs> like I told her she could never hurt me, and I sobbed like a baby." But I remember as a young guy, a guy, I put my hope in a relationship that I thought was a godly relationship, and basically it got wiped out. I had, you know, and, and I didn't date anybody until I met Helen in the chip shop. I had a choice to, to allow the fact that hope had left me down to, to not allow me to hope again. Do you see what I mean? But I chose that, okay, hope's a hard thing. Hope, sometimes hope disappears, but God's hope is always perfect. And I met Helen in a chip shop. I was serving the chips, and I looked across the steamy chip pan. There she was in a green uniform with a baseball cap on, and I just knew fried cod and a bag of chips, and she was mine. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was a little bit more romantic, but not much. But now I have an amazing wife who's traveled around the world, and we've got three amazing kids, and as together we're in the plan of God. But I had to choose to hope again. If you're here and you've been in a relationship breakup and you're single or whatever it might be or you know, whatever and you've been done, let, let me hope again. Hope again. Because God, if God's wired you to be in a to be a, a family man or a woman, what God will what God will meet your needs. God wired me. God knew, knew I needed a wife. Uh, and I put my hope back in God, and then he sent me Helen, which was way better than Becky Gibson. Way better. She's hot. She's mine. Can I say that in church? Just did. Hang on. My, my iPad's just gone off. You know, hope, you know, the hope for, hum, for hope for humanity was one on a cross. Wasn't it? It wasn't, it wasn't one in this amazing little story. It was one by the Savior of mankind being strung up on a wooden cross and horrifically killed for my hope and my salvation. So why don't we fight to make that count? We, I think sometimes we give up too easy on, on, on a hope in God because we don't want the battle that comes with it. You know, we don't want to fight for hope. We don't want to fight for hope for our families, for hope for our communities, because we just think it should be this fluffy little emotion that just wafts into our lives. Let me tell you, hope was won for you in a battle. You know, uh, I, 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 I will fight for it. I will fight for hope for Newport. Spent 10 years in A&E in the Royal Gwent. I've seen people robbed of their hope in a moment. I will fight for it because it is worth fighting for. I, I will spend time in prayer and fasting for hope for other people. I have friends that lost people, loved ones before Christmas. I am fighting for their hope because God has put me in a privileged place that Jesus won my hope and I'm going to fight to win other people's hope. I think sometimes, you know, we've got a whole season in February called in February Fast. It's good, isn't it? It rhymes, February Fast. But the whole reason we're doing February Fast as a, ch as a church is because we want to pray and fast. And one of the things I want to do is pray and fast that we can win the hope back for Newport that we can win the hope back for Roger Stone and that we can be a, a vessel that God can use in a, in a violent way against the forces of evil to bring hope back for our nation. Do you see? But we think, oh, hope. No, hope is violently won sometimes. 
that's my that's my challenge for 2018 for me is when I'm sat down with with police God's suddenly starting to put me into places of favor because of what Jordan's doing with the youth people want to talk to us about our youth program with with what we're doing with Stora I'm starting to find myself surrounded by people that are in influence within our community and yes I want to play it cool but God says no I want you to play it how I've told you to play it I will give you the words when I put you before kings and queens it says it in the Bible Keep switching off my iPad. You know, my challenge for us as a church is we need hope for ourselves. Sometimes if you're here this morning and you're like, yeah, that's great, Mike, yeah, whatever. You know, I don't really know what that means. Maybe you need to start looking for hope in God in a different place. Maybe you need to say, God, am I looking for something to give me hope in the wrong place, in the wrong, in the wrong direction? Maybe you need to, to to give God some of the things that stand between you and hope, like grief, like failures, like letdowns, like promotions you didn't get, like financial struggles. The devil will allow that to stand between you and hope. And you need to look somewhere different. You need to put it in there. But the one thing I felt that when we were praying about this is that, that right now, I know in my, my life right now is two people that need God's, God's hope in their life. And I think right now in this room, there's a, there's a collection of people. I know Stella's got friends that have, have lost, that have died recently. And Stella just carries such warmth and, and love. If you know Stella, she gives the best hugs. She's got a real gift of just walking into your world and smiling at you. And just, you know, and I know there's people in Stella's world that God's put Stella there because he's going to bring God's hope to that situation. I, I just want us to take a moment and, and I wanted us to pray for one another. I know some people are new and if that's cool, just, just bear with us, have another chocolate, whatever it is. But if you're here this morning in your family, I'd like us to pray for one another and pray to, that we have the strength to be the hope in the people's world. You know, uh, Kate, she works with young offenders with speech and language therapy. One of the young boys, I saw him before Christmas. He'd done all his hours. I said, I'm not going to see you again, am I? Oh, no, no, you won't see me again. Who walks in on Thursday morning with my mate? I was like, what did you get done for this time? He said, oh, they found some more stuff on me. Lovely kid. Lovely kid. Just no family. Just needs hope. I'm praying that somehow between our relationship of fixing things in this building, I can bring God's hope to his life. Let's pray for Kate, you know, let's pray for Stella. Uh, let's pray. If you're here this morning, you're like, yeah, I know there's people in my world and God's put me there to bring his hope to that world, to bring uh, eternity to that world through Jesus. I want us to stand together as a community and say, I want to stand with you and pray for you. I, I want to come alongside you and support you. Does that make sense? This is a little bit weird, but I want us to do it as a family this morning because not only does family get along and we have a laugh, but family prays for one another. Family says, I've got nothing to fight for right at the moment. I'm cool. But you have. Someone said to me, oh, I'm bored with church. I said, the reason you're bored with church is because it isn't doing anything for you. And they're like, yeah. I said, well, maybe church isn't all about you. Maybe in this season, your life's cool so that you could help someone else. Does that make sense? So maybe if your life is cool this morning, maybe you need to stand next to Stella and say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that you're going to be bold. I'm going to pray for you, Kate. Cool. What I want us to do, let's stand to our feet. Let's pray for Jordan. 80 young people on a Friday night in this building that know nothing about God. He's right in the middle telling them about Jesus and half of them don't want to listen. And the other half just come in stoned, literally. We need to pray for this guy and get around him and say, hey, every Friday night I'm going to stand and, and I'm going to fight for hope for those young people by praying for you. That's cool. I'm going to pray, and then what I want us to do, if we don't mind, can we pray for you, Stella? Can we pray for you, Kate? Can we pray for you, Jordan? Um, if, you, if you feel comfortable, if you don't, stay where you are. But if you don't, just get alongside these people, put a hand on their shoulder, and we'll pray, and we'll just pray for God's strength and God's courage in their lives that they can be the vessels of hope in their world. Pray for Chris and Rianne and what they do with Scouts. What a great organization, and, and what a privilege to have them using our building. You know? One of the few 
youth organizations that's still strongly built on Christian values. I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to pray and then we're going to get around these people. Yeah, Lord, I just thank you right now that you've given us a hope that goes beyond this physical world. You give, through the sacrifice of your, your son, we have an ability to have a hope in eternity. That, that when this life is finished, we get to live with you in heaven. And Lord, I just pray right now that we would rise up as a church and, and be the answer to, that, that you want us to be, to be the people, the vessels of hope to a broken community, uh, to, uh, to those dying or desperate situations, Lord. I pray right now for everybody in this room, if they've lost their hope, I pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would restore it, that you would give them the courage to look on that curve, to, to hope in a different place, the hope that was won on a cross, was won in such violent ways for us, but brings such love and peace to us. But Lord, I thank you that I, me, stood here, a sinner by grace, can stand in the hope of eternity with you and in the peace and the love that that brings. In Jesus' name. Let's just take a minute. Lewis is just going to play quietly. Let's just put our hands around these guys. If you're stood behind them, put your hand on their shoulder and we're going to pray.